Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is David Burt. David is CFO at Service Titan, where he brings seasoned finance, operations, and strategy experience to the leading software operating system for home and commercial service contractors. Prior to Service Titan, David most recently served as Vice President of Content Planning and Analysis and Co-Head of Corporate Development for the online streaming service, Netflix, where he helped the company rapidly expand its international footprint from a U.S. only to a global player, while also overseeing its rapid investment in original content around the globe. Before joining Netflix, David worked for J.P. Morgan Securities as an investment banker, and for Bain & Company as a strategy consultant. David earned a Master of Business Administration from Harvard University and a Bachelor's Degree in Accounting from the University of Technology, Sydney. David, welcome to CFO Weekly, and thank you so much for taking the time today to share your experience with us. Thank you for uh, having me and, and on behalf of Service Titan as well. Yeah, today we're talking about how finance can help balance risk and reward and contribute to a company's growth rather than hindering it. And David, I'm looking forward to this discussion and hearing about your experience and advice. So let's get started. Tell me about your career progression. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, it's been an interesting road. I I, uh, was born and raised in Australia. I spent the first few years of my working career in Australia at at Bain & Company, you know, strategy consulting capacity. I was very fortunate that I had an opportunity to transfer within Bain up to Singapore and and then so did that and spent an additional three years at Bain in the Singapore office. And at that point in time, I had really, really enjoyed my experience at Bain, but was looking to to do something different. And everyone around me had gone to business school, had spoken so highly of the experience. And I felt that that was one thing, that sort of incredible educational experience was something that I was missing. So I had the good fortune of getting into and going to the Harvard Business School, where I spent two years getting my MBA. And as I was going into the MBA experience, I had not long before then, completed a, a case with a private equity case. And funnily enough, it was buying out Singapore's Yellow Pages business, which seems like a forever and ago a day. But 2003, at least, that was the most popular, one of the most popular assets to buy. And I was very intrigued by that deal process and what went into that. And so in going into business school, I felt that I would target a summer internship and then ultimately a full-time position in the area of investment banking because I felt like that was something that I was very curious about and wanted to learn more about. So I did that with JP Morgan. I spent my summer at JP Morgan and then uh, ended up full-time in New York, JP Morgan, focused in and around the private equity space, which was really interesting in the time. But for personal and professional reasons, a couple of years into my experience at JP Morgan, I had an opportunity to move out to the West Coast. And that was at the end of 2008, early 2009 to join what was then a very small but growing team focused on internet and digital media assets, or not assets, but uh, companies. And that was, you know, 2009, it's hard to think, as 11 years ago, we were focused on companies that today are the biggest companies in the world, Google, Facebook in particular. And I was working with clients like the, those two companies in particular, but also some uh, earlier stage startup companies, one in particular, Chegg, is now you know, doing incredibly well in the educational technology space. But at that point in time, had revolutionized textbook rentals, and that was we were helping them raise some money. I really fell in love with the clients that I had and the work that they were doing and felt that I would be best placed focusing my efforts and energy on one company and one set of, you know, that, that company's set of problems that they're trying to solve for. And one of my clients, in fact, the first client that I was, assigned to when I moved out to San Francisco was Netflix. And uh, in, tw- in 2009, Netflix was both a DVD and streaming business, but uh, publicly people mostly knew the company for its DVD business. But within the company, what was very clear was the, the power of, of streaming. And anyway, in 2010, I was very fortunate that I was extended an offer and ultimately joined the company down in L.A., in their content office, which at the time, I think we had about 50 people in the office. I had a team of about six. And over an eight-year period, we grew 
the company, but in particular, the, the, the investments we were making in content from $400 million in, in 2010 to $8 billion on a P&L basis, $12 billion on a cash basis in 2018 when I left. And, you know, the company just continues to do incredibly well. And so, you know, that was an incredible experience over that eight-year period, watching the company go through highs and lows, mostly highs, but some lows. If you remember in 2011, the company sought to, to split the company, didn't handle that particularly well. And, uh, but through the highs of expanding ultimately globally by 2016, shifting from a renter of content to a producer of content and doing so on an exclusive basis and all the sort of zigs and zags in between. And so that was great. Now in August of 2018, a recruiter reached out to me and presented an opportunity to interview for this CFO position at Service Titan. Very fortunate that I actually knew someone at the company. I had placed a reference for that person about a year and a half prior into the FP&A team. He, he gifted me some of his time on a Sunday and I just was fascinated about what the company was doing, but perhaps more fascinated about what the company could do into the future. And the company just in a you know, sort of a sentence is seeking to be the operating system of the trades. And what that really means is using software and technology to power every business process and interaction that a trades company might have, ultimately allowing them to be more efficient, more productive, more profitable, and allowing their technicians to do better work. And uh, so I thought that sounded amazing. No one else was doing it. The two founders were exceptional. They are exceptional. So I joined the company about two, a bit over two years ago now, and the company has grown rapidly because of this real focus and mission that we have. Great set of employees. And uh, that's where I am today. Sounds like an amazing career with a lot of great experience. And I'd actually forgotten that Netflix ever did DVDs. (laughs) Okay, so are there any particular stories or moves that stand out in your mind as turning points within your career? Yeah, I think, you know, if I look back on my career, and I've still got a long way to go, you know, you almost have these kind of call it two, three year blocks where you think in that first year of that block, you're really getting up the learning curve to understand what's going on. You're, you might be lacking a little bit of competence in the area and as a result, some confidence too, but you're, you know, you're rapidly learning. And then that second year, you're in the mastery sort of stage. You're not quite there yet. And then the third year, you're definitely a master. But in that third year, you're thinking about what's that next big thing that I can step up to. And it doesn't need to be so structured like that, but I have seen that play out for myself as I have for for others too. And if I think about, you know, my Bain experience, I did about two years in in Sydney before um, moving up to Singapore and then I did three years and that was that shift of location and the different sets of clients it was really helpful same thing and you know in my JP Morgan experience and then you know Netflix was was fascinating because the company itself just grew in all sorts of different ways and directions but when I look back on it it seems so sort of seamless but at no point in time did I ever feel like I wasn't challenged? And and I think that's sort of looking back and for anyone, you know, I think anything less than that, that sort of two, three years is too short to sort of really be able to say you mastered something. Do you see a lot of resumes of folks these days where it's like one year here, one year there, one year there. And in the interview, it's like, well, I, you know, I learned everything I could possibly know. And I, and I question whether that's really true because it takes some time to really be able to dig deep on, um, and get your teeth into certain areas. So yeah, so that's what I would I would say in just terms of looking out. It kind of looks like it was all very well planned, but I can assure you it wasn't. But the last thing I would say is there is also an element of gut instinct in there. Netflix in 2010 when I joined was certainly an interesting company, but it's not the company it is today. It wasn't so well known as it is today, but I knew that they were onto something. And even I go back to Bain and Company in 1999, when I accepted my offer there, it was not where it's thought of today as a big three consulting firm. It was, you know, BCG and McKinsey were the top two. And then there was a big group after that. Um, But there was something about the culture. 
and something about the interactions I had had that I knew in my gut that that was going to match well. That's really interesting. I've never really thought about that three-year life cycle of uh, an opportunity, but uh, yeah, you're right. So referring back to your time with Bain, I'm always intrigued when very young professionals with limited quote unquote real world experience are able to advise businesses on how to transform. So this is kind of a two point question. First, what unique skill sets are required to be able to do this? That's a really interesting question. And I, what's interesting about it is I remember being in my first year at Bain, my first few months and being put onto a client situation. And I severely doubted myself whether I could do it. I remember having a conversation heart to heart with my manager saying, how could I possibly at this age be doing this, etc." And he said, look, we hired you because you're very smart. We hired you because you're curious. You're going to ask a lot of questions. We have, a, a, as, a, as a consulting firm, a deep body of knowledge. And within this consulting team, a deep amount of experience. This is not, you're not doing this all on your own shoulders. But what we need you to do is really dig in and build, a, in that particular case, it was a set of models to model out the business performance and so forth. And so in that position that I was in, I wasn't trying to solve necessarily the, the, the client's problems by myself, but at the same time, I realized pretty quickly where I could add a lot of value. And, and, and mostly it was around applying a deep level of curiosity and trying to understand business processes, understand the data that the company had at the time. And what was amazing pretty quickly was some of the analysis that we were doing that the company and the the data we were pulling, the company itself hadn't even ever thought to look at before. That was a rather large insurance company in Australia and we helped turn that business around considerably and it ultimately ended up getting sold to a, a major conglomerate. So what advice would you offer a business leader who knows that they need to transform but doesn't have the money to pay consultants? How, how can one go about tackling that transformation themselves? The most difficult thing with a transformation is it's big and it's hard. Usually the reason why most companies and most executives get caught in not changing anything is that I mean, it's going to sound pretty motherhood and apple pie, but like they just don't carve out the time to try to figure out how to do things completely differently. And so my two pieces of advice would be, first, you carve out that time to do that because no one else is going to carve it out for you. And then second, hire people who are going to innovate. I hear all the time people say things like, well, this person is good enough for the role. I don't want to hire someone who's you know, innovative or ambitious for this particular role because they're going to get bored. And to that, I, I strike that down immediately because what I've found in my career that in every role, there is room for innovation. In every role, you seek the best out of the people that you might have. I remember fondly one of the janitors that we had at our office in at Netflix, she went about doing things in a way that like people weren't expecting the janitor to do that. She ended up moving on to being a facility manager at the company, has done quite well, and she's made big changes. Now, big changes relative to what was expected of her. Now, if you could imagine having everyone on your team be that way, deeply curious and, and changing things. I had another individual, I remember, join my team at, at Netflix who you know, was a couple years out of college, joined as an analyst. And some of the work that he did without us asking to build models that sort of automated the way that we valued content was incredibly valuable. And if I had stuck to the good enough model, I may have hired someone else before hiring him and wouldn't have had the benefit of that. So to me, that's really important that you carve out time as a leader, but you also hire people that are going to have that mindset. Yep, that's great advice. Um, So let's switch gears and talk about your current organization. What does Service Titan do? We're the operating system for the trades. What does that mean? We have a software uh, service uh, that helps our customers. Our customers are trades companies. So think of your local plumbing, HVAC, electrical uh, service provider 
helps them run their business. And we do that in a number of different ways, but at the core, we provide a customer relationship management system that starts from when a call comes in to the call getting booked and all of the service steps in between, including the technology on the front end, the technician that's out in the field that would ultimately touch the end customer, to a field service management set of features that help optimize the booking of jobs and making sure that those jobs follow through to deliver great service to the end customer, to a set of tools for the office that help the office management as well as the business owner monitor the performance of the company so that they can best utilize all of the resources that they have, which ultimately drives greater profit for those business owners and and greater efficiency. But there's things beyond profit too. And we've had incredible customer testimonials of business owners who have talked about the improvements in their personal life because they're no longer doing manual tasks. They're no longer staying up late at night to do things that software can do. And so at a base layer, that's what we do. We, we also have innovated to add on top of our service a financing and payment suite of, of products so our customers can run all of their payments and third-party consumer financing through our, our service. We have marketing automation tools, inventory management tools, and so forth and so on. And ultimately, what we're seeking to do is build as I said, an operating system, the best example I use is think of the iPhone and all of the things the iPhone can do for you as an individual. Well, in the same way, we're trying to build the operating system for our companies so that we can automate and make more efficient and more productive all of their business processes so they can focus on delivering exceptional service to their end customers. Sounds like a very valuable tool. I mean, it's amazing. Yes, and and tool, no pun intended, of course. (laughs) So talk to me about the last two years you've spent there. What have those years looked like and what have been your biggest challenges? We've grown very rapidly over the two-year period. And, you know, most recently we announced that we hit 200 million in ARR, which is a a pretty uh, sizable milestone for a software company. I think the couple of challenges that we faced as a business when you're running so fast is how do you build into process scale and scale in particular around the people that you have in place, the processes of the company and the systems as well. And I think I was used to myself a much bigger infrastructure around those three things. And I think the the learning over the last two years has been there's no amount of sort of getting your hands dirty and getting in and being deeply curious about everything that's going on. Uh, you know, I can't stress enough how important that is to do early on. But the balance is not getting yourself into almost a rut of, doing just that and then never being able to carve out the time and elevate to look at how you might do things differently. And in particular, when it comes around people and processes, putting, you know, hiring in place people that will give you scale and give you leverage. And I've I've certainly, you know, I think probably one of your questions would be, what would you wish you had done differently? Mm -hmm. Um, I know for me, identifying the key leadership positions earlier on and hiring more quickly into those leadership positions. I'm very excited about two recent senior executives that I've hired in the area of finance and and IT. So that's two years in and I I finally found uh, the candidate, you know, the individuals that I wanted on the team. I wish I had these two individuals two years ago because I'm already seeing in the month that the two have each been on board, how much leverage, you know, each bring out on board. And I think as a lesson for folks that are listening, you know, it's common for people to focus too much on the dollars and focus too much on, well, gee, you know, I'm only allowed to spend X for someone. And, and so I'm going to hire up to someone that's going to accept for this. And what I found is there is a degree of exponential value that you get by paying for the right people who are often outside of your band. 
and in and the sad thing is in in many cases it's not as though they're outside of the band by a significant magnitude you know i i remember one example of a manager that we hired onto our fpna team and the individual was not that much more outside of the the sort of set salary band and the team came to me and said hey look look we really like this person we want you to meet with them but we're just not sure that it's going to fit within this. And I met with the individual. I said, trust me on this. We're going to pay outside the band because we'll get a lot more leverage. That individual's done exceptionally well in the company and has proven that point many times over. But I think, you know, often people get myopically focused on trying to kind of cut costs, hire people that are less experienced and grow them into the role. And when you're in a very fast paced environment where literally days matter, you, you just can't afford to do that. Yeah, I'm sure there's a huge return on investment for hiring the right people. Absolutely. Absolutely in what they can do and also the opportunity cost of what place they take from someone else that could be there that's better. And and you touched on this a bit with getting your hands dirty, but I feel a huge part of being able to advise the business strategically involves understanding the operations. So given that finance has historically been a siloed support structure, what steps can CFOs take to better understand the business and break down silos? Well, one thing you is perhaps obvious, but you've got to find time to meet with business owners and and not just to show face, but really try to get in and understand their business problems. And to do that and to be invited to the table over again, chances are you're going to need to add value to them. And that might mean taking on a, a project that might be a little bit outside of what's expected of you to show that you can be a great partner. And use the term um, support. I'm, I'm not a fan of that term when it comes to the finance function or any of the functions that I lead, legal operations and, and IT. Because going back to a point I made earlier about trying to hire in people that are innovative, often when you cast people as support staff, it's almost deemed as though they are there to take direction from someone else and execute exactly on that direction. And that's going to be fine in certain areas, but for the most part, in knowledge, with knowledge-based work, you're not going to get the most out of people and you're not going to hire the best people in to, to doing that. And so as a result, I like to think of all of my teams as partner organizations across the company. And when you're a partner, that means that you've got to work together to figure out what it is that you're trying to solve. If it's, you know, one of the finance teams, it's partnering with a business development team to understand the deal structure or partnering with the customer support team to understand what their staffing needs might be, as opposed to sort of as you use the term, sitting in a dark room and taking inputs and not having context. That context is incredibly important. And I think what often also happens is folks on the finance team don't appreciate or realize how interesting the work that they're doing might be to the other parts of the business. And I would sort of say that credit a former colleague of mine, JC Berger at at, at Netflix, he did a really nice job of taking what was very complex accounting and finance topics, boiling it down, making it more simple and easily understood across the rest of the business so that people who were actually curious about some of these topics but kind of scared to ask because it was so complicated really understood them, at least at the level that was necessary. And so that's the other thing I would say is in that two-way partnership model, don't be shy of educating the business on what it is that you do and why accounting is important, why the planning process is important, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great point. And and I like the term partnership because there is so much that the two organizations or departments can learn from each other. Yeah. And look, the other thing that I would point out that I think is important, two other things. One is, and this is certainly a learning that I've had here at Service Titan, As innovative as you think your company might be, as interesting as the work might be that you're doing, chances are someone somewhere has done that thing before. 
maybe not that specific feature that's being delivered in the software, but from a finance standpoint, chances are someone else has gone through the process of doing a foreign NA valuation, or they've gone through the process of determining sales and use tax application, or they've gone through the process of setting up quota retirement schemes, whatever it might be. And I found what's been very powerful in my experience here at Service Titan has been the power of my of the network of other CFOs and finance professionals, in particular through my investors. We're very fortunate at Service Titan. We have some of the best, if not the best, sort of software investors in the world. And so through their networks, like Bessemer, for example, through their network, I am put in touch with other peer CFOs who've been invaluable in helping my education. And in turn, I contribute to theirs. So, you know, you're not alone. And uh, I definitely would encourage reaching out. And the second thing that I think is critically important to do and is often not done is spending time with your customers particularly as a software company, it's easy to sort of sit behind the knowledge that you look at the reports and you say, hey, retention's great or you know, new sales coming in is great. But if you don't really spend time with your customers, you don't really have a chance to, to understand the business processes that then drive the core parts of the business like sales and marketing and customer delivery and, and product development. And so something that I wish that I actually spend more time doing myself is actually going out, visiting a customer, getting in, understanding and using the product. That's something that I would also say is hugely valuable uh, to the learning and ultimately, you know, your ability to be able to truly advise the business or work with the business on improving performance. That's great advice. And yeah, I feel like a lot of companies fail because they lose sight of the customer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I know we've touched on this just a little bit, but how do you build a high performing team? What qualities are you looking for to ensure that Service Titan is successful? I think there's a couple of things that go into building a high performance team. First of all, you need to have a clear understanding of what the team is seeking to achieve. So clarity around the goals and clarity around the mission vision is very important. And not in a warm and fuzzy sense, but in a very clear-cut, context-driven, communicative way. You know, so if I, I think about here at Service Titan, our vision is to be the operating system of the trades. And we have a few things that fall behind that, but that's clearly understood. At Netflix, it was very clear the context was set around what our goals were to deliver the service around the world and create a you know, global entertainment service. When you find time to draw out that clarity and that simplicity in the message of what you're trying to achieve, that in and unto itself has scale. And that's sort of the, one of the first points of building a high-performance team. The second piece would be in hiring in your key executives that as, as an executive yourself allow you to scale. You know, different people have different views on this, but I found that a strong mix of curiosity and exceptional ethics and business judgment, the two things that are for me deal breakers. If you don't have those two things, I don't think you're going to work well with me. And I don't think that you're going to work well in the companies that I've had the fortune of working with. And then I'd say the third element that then differentiates the folks that would be applicable in that pool, high curiosity, high judgment ethics, is this element of innovation that I talked about earlier. Is the sort of innate ability to continuously look at what you're doing and saying, hey, there has to be a better way. I figure I can find out a better way to cut 2% off here, 5% off there, or in some cases, make big shifts that that change the way that, that we work and do things better. And that you do so in a way that it's not for individual gain. It's, you know, you're constantly looking out. You know, I love the employee who would reach out and say, hey, I noticed that we're doing this particular thing in finance. And I'd heard that this other company does it this way. Like, have you guys thought about that? Now, 
that employee might sit in the customer support team, have nothing to do with finance, but they took time out of their day to sort of point something out that could be helpful. That I love. And I look for that in the individuals joining the team. And then I think the final thing and something that I could do a lot better myself, to be honest, is celebrating wins, taking the time to actually appreciate, not in a superficial way, but in a genuine way, the work of the team. Because when you're running so fast, it's, it's often, you know, particularly where, where, you know, the individuals that were around very ambitious, we tend to focus on the faults and the things that we do wrong and how to fix them. And we don't spend enough time celebrating the things that we've done very well. And I think that's important, particularly in the environment we're in right now, where you do not have that, you know, day-to-day human contact in the office to remind people how important the work is that they're doing and how well they're doing with that work. I love your focus on curiosity. I feel like that is often an underestimated trait. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting because there are people who are deeply curious but lack judgment. That's not necessarily going to be your best hire because you're going to end up spending a lot of time going down rabbit holes uh, and answering questions that are not productive or worse still have negative consequences. Yeah, very true. Those two traits together uh, are very important. I've heard you give the advice to not sweat the small stuff, but how do you recognize that an issue is small versus something that actually needs your attention? That's a great question. I'm not sure that I am am 100% perfect on this one, but I usually look at the situations where it's almost a a two by two is, is the particular issue at hand large or small. That's usually something that you could measure up in the moment, but the situations where I might pick on, you know, choose to use some time on something that's small of impact is when it's repeatable. If I can see that, you know, for example, there's a particular issue with expense reporting that mightn't be a ton of money, but it's, it's something that seems to be repeating every week. I'm going to spend my time on that because you can do the math on on how much is saved by doing and and, and dealing with that now and not letting it, it drip. This is quite important, I think, as you model with your own teams around what's important to take issue with and what's not. And there's, you know, as a leader, people watch you closely about, you know, where you repeat activity and where you where you focus your time or not and then they follow from that too so uh, i often do see folks will get particularly in finance functions very focused on like oh well this is going to cost us an extra you know x thousand dollars and so forth and then my question would be okay well is this a one-time thing or is this something that's going to repeat itself because if it's really truly a one-time thing and it doesn't have any other ramifications probably let that one go But if it's something that it's going to set a precedent, it's going to cause issues down the line, when it comes to compensation, is it going to have broader ramifications within the company and the culture and so forth? That's where you want to, even if it's not material, that's where you want to ultimately step in because it will be material over time. I love that advice. Okay, so you're no stranger to high growth organizations. So how can finance help manage a rocket ship's growth? What have you seen work well to support growth versus hindering it? I think of the finance team's sort of role as being the enabler. And you always want to be pouring a little more oil on the fire to help fuel that growth, but knowing when you need to to pull back. And so I think a couple of simple things the finance team needs to to do. First of all, you want to try as best you can to set up a framework for approving spend that is tied to some kind of measurable metric. You know, in the case of Netflix for the content team, it was measuring it against what we we had a version of an engagement score. And for the most part, that enabled all of the content executives around the world working with my team to be able to make decisions freely and quickly without some other higher level sign off and and so forth. And it was a common language, if you will, across all of the, uh, the organizations that way. So that's, that's first and foremost. So the best that you can do that, you know, in the case here at Service Titan, we, 
by different groups will have different yardstick measures, whether it be sales efficiency, marketing of performance, et cetera, to, to sort of approve that. You want to try to cut down as many approvals as possible, but that's not throwing out all approvals. So, you know, putting some exception-based approval processes in place. And then I'd say that the, the other piece of it is setting up a, a culture of if you're going to take bets, let's measure those bets. Let's document those bets. And let's not punish people for taking bets that fail, but at least at least, at least acknowledge when something is a bet versus something we, we believe was a sure thing. And, you know, if I think back to some of the bets that we've made over the last two years, and in particular in, the, in my time at Netflix over that eight-year period, we were very explicit about certain things being where we were betting. And so, therefore, if you think of it from a pure investment standpoint, the expected beta is higher, but then the returns were greater too. And so, you had a greater tolerance for risk. And then as a finance executive, when you roll all of that up, if at any point in time, everything that you're spending is on bets, that's probably not a good way to run the company. But if you're not spending enough of your percentage of budget on bets, chances are in a year or two from now, you'll find that you haven't invested enough in things that are for future growth. And so constantly trying to get that that balance right. And if I were to boil it all down, I like to think of my teams as being the how, you know, a lot of the finance teams that historically exist in, in companies are the house of no. Same with the legal team, same with the um, with anything else that's sort of focused and centered around risk. And I think the best finance legal teams, particularly in high growth scenario, high growth uh, companies should be considered the house of yes, but let's just make sure that we manage the risks that we do know and are aware of appropriately. So as finance professionals, many of us are inherently risk averse. So how can we lean into risk and learn to become more comfortable with it? Part of it is acknowledging where something is a complete showstopper, like this thing is going to bring the company down versus, no, it has some risks with it. So let's just document what those risks are and let's not, you know, let's try to avoid the stupid mistakes. There's probably examples that I shouldn't uh, on the podcast of what that might be, but let's not try to do the things that if you did it once and you knew that it was a problem and then you did it a second time, people would say, why didn't you learn from the first time? And we have examples of that, particularly on the legal side, but but also on on the finance side as well. However, again, going back to that mantra of, of being the house of yes, but I think that mindset shift is, is important because what you've got to also realize is there is a greater cost to not doing something and then missing out the learning that you might have had versus doing something failing, but then rapidly learning about that failing that ultimately informs you to do something different into the future. There's this interesting a, a information asymmetry there that's always sort of stuck with me in you know the things that we did at Netflix and now that we're doing at Service Titan, learning about those mistakes and then rapidly moving and pivoting based on that learning that you would never know if you didn't ultimately make those bets in the first place. Yeah, I love that. I um, I, I think when you fail, that's, that's when you learn the most, if, if, as long as you're learning from those mistakes. That's right. And that's, that's the key. It's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a buzzy thing, particularly in Silicon Valley, to talk about failing fast and so forth. And I believe there are examples of companies that probably misuse the, that uh, point of view to failing all the time and, and then chalking up the failures as learning experiences when they're not actually learning anything. They're just continuously failing on the same things. So thankfully, uh, Netflix and now Service Titan is not, not in that camp. So what should CFOs be focusing on and how can they prepare themselves for tomorrow's challenges? I mean, there's a, a myriad of things that we should be focused on, but I think the, the main areas for CFOs to focus on is how do you help instrument and enable the business to grow rapidly and responsibly, and in particular, through those three elements of people, processes, and systems? 
and I think as CFOs, it's it I happen to think it's one of the most difficult roles in the company because you're expected to know as much as the CEO about everything, but you aren't always included in the room about everything. And so in terms of the future challenges, you know, how does that play out where you can carve out a, a role in particular is looking ahead on uh, things like I, IT deployments and workplace productivity. And in particular, I think the role of the CFO, not just being the person that puts their finance hat on and says, okay, well, there's a budget, stay within it. It's how do we get the most out of our biggest asset as a company, our employees, and what sort of systems and tools and processes should we put in place so that we can get the most out of those assets? I think that's one of the bigger challenges that CFOs need to acknowledge and, and, and realize they're a big part of solving for the company, not just sort of setting a budget and then thinking that others will, will take care of that. There's obviously a myriad of other challenges. This year has been a particularly interesting year to navigate through as a finance professional. Do you pull back you know, quickly, given there was so much unknowns in sort of March and April with the impact of COVID? A big part of the success of a CFO is making sure that you continuously and transparently provide information to the uh, management to the entire company and to your board about what's going on, doing so with integrity, doing so in a timely manner. And so in order to do that, again, going back to that people, processes, and systems, you need to have constant improvement in those areas to be able to uh, provide that timely and transparent information. And you need to also have the courage to be able to speak up when things aren't going well. And oftentimes make the hard calls on cutting off investments or in some cases, you know, if you have to scale back on staff. And then lastly, as we look to enter 2021, uh, what's one thing you're looking forward to achieving either professionally or personally? It's hard to boil it down to one thing. Very excited. I have two young children, love their evolution and, and, uh, and particularly having spent a lot more time with them over the course of the last year. So I think I'm, I'm excited about seeing them grow and particularly their adoption of technology. But I'm also excited in, in particular about seeing them learn more about Service Titan. And I think in 2021, as the company is growing itself and as we become more known in the public eye, I think for them getting a better appreciation of what we do and the impact that we're having on our customers is going to be kind of neat. You know, when I was at Netflix, that was a pretty easy one because my daughter was born in 2015. All of her friends by three, four years of age knew exactly what Netflix was. You know, so my goal is to make sure that uh, my kids can tell their friends all about Surface Titan in the next year. Yeah, that's great. I look forward to seeing the great things that company does as well. Yeah, absolutely. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Megan, for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, I've enjoyed speaking with you and getting your perspective on how finance can contribute to the growth of a company on the fast track. To all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this episode as well. Please tune in next week. And until then, take care of yourselves. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personiv.com. Thanks for listening.